so before we get started talking about the story, um, I just want to discuss briefly what I want you guys doing um, for next time. All right, so we're going to be starting on what's going to become the first draft of the first paper, right? Up to now, the homework assignments and the in-class writings have sort of been trying to build up uh, writing and thinking skills that'll help you with the paper. So you're actually going to start writing it now. Um, so you're going to be doing the assignment on page 179 in writing analytically on formulating and evolving a thesis. But instead of a visual image or a film, the subject you're going to be using is one of the stories that we've read thus far in class, any of the stories. Right, so this means you can use right, cathedral, Sonny's Blues, The Cask of Amontillado, Recitative, or A Wall of Fire Rising as your subject. Now what you're going to write is going to be about two, you know, should be about two pages long. Um, you don't need to include any supporting material with it this time. I don't need, say, like, you know, a list of scratch work. Um, you know, with some of the previous assignments I wanted to show your work, that's not going to be quite so much necessary here. And your goal here is to try to write your way towards a thesis statement, right? Some general arguments that you want to make about what you think is most important in this particular story, right? And there are a couple of examples you can use as models in the textbook, right? So if you look in writing analytically on page 162, um, there's you know, a student paper as an example there on a painting by Velasquez. And on page 172, there's an example of um, thesis development through a paper um, on the film in Bruges. So you can use those as models, right? Please do feel free to contact me if you have questions. This is going to grow in, this is going to grow into the draft. Okay, does anybody have any questions right now about this? What page is that on model from? It's on page 179. And it's not, no, it's not numbered. Um, it's just, there's only the one assignment, so. Any other questions? When is this due? Uh, this will be due, say, uh, Thursday night. Any other questions? Yeah, Frank. Um, what was, it was assignment what again? It doesn't have a number. It's just on page 179. It's the only assignment on page 179. Anything else? All right. Then let's talk about the story. What did you think? The ending was bad. Pardon? The ending was bad. It's bad? Yeah. Bad. bad. Terrible. Pardon? I kind of felt like he was going to die. Like he kind of Okay, so you you felt like Guy was kind of doomed from the beginning. Foreshadowing. Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. What 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 clues were uh, did you have that he's doomed from the start? Oh, like you know what the son was saying, like the word that he was reciting, like if you read them closely, uh huh. Like, I don't know what sadness or like you know talking about freedom or something from like that. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I thought, I, was, I thought it was gonna be the little guy. Not but then when I okay. read, whatever. But the only way Guy will find freedom is in death. Yeah, like, because he was talking about how he wanted to be bigger and better. Like, he wanted to start his father. Uh-huh. So, so it might help if we talk a little bit about context here. This might make some of what's going on in the story make a little bit more sense. How many of you know anything about, uh, about the history of Haiti? Where the story takes place. Yeah, if 
if it's in our consciousness at all, right, it's probably because of that earthquake a few years ago um, that the country is still recovering from. Um, what else do you get? Like, how does Haiti look in your imagination? How do you imagine? How do you how do you think Haiti looks? What do you think it's like? It's like a struggling country. Yeah, it, it's one of those countries that we always think of as poor, right? <coughs> Impoverished. Right, ruled by a series of brutal dictators. Yeah, and I think as you said, sort of, yeah, sort of like struggling, right? Now, apart from the earthquake, do any of you know anything about the history of this country at all? Yeah, okay, Frank, yes, go ahead. Um, what I know is uh, kind of sketchy, we haven't really gotten to that in colonial America yet, but mm -hmm. I know it was the place of the only successful slave revolt, really yeah. successful slave revolt. They um, rebelled mm -hmm. against the French, mm -hmm. overthrew them, and um, established a free democracy. Ish. <laughs> well, as close as they could. Well, <laughs> yeah, one, yeah, one thing that is definitely very important that you know that, yeah, is that this is, Haiti is the site of the only successful slave revolution anywhere in the world in history, right? Usually, slave revolts were put down pretty fast and pretty brutally. Spartacus had a good run, but in the end, too Yeah, well, I, I think, you know, the, there were a couple of advantages the, the, in Haiti, France was otherwise occupied. Um, and it was far away. Um, but yeah, so Haiti was actually, it's on an island uh, called Hispaniola. The other side of it is the Dominican Republic. Um, and this was the first island that Columbus landed, uh, one of the first islands that Columbus landed on in his journey to the New World. Now, the people who lived there when he landed uh, were called the Taino. The Taino are gone now. They're extinct. There are no more. In part because when Columbus landed and began the process of colonizing and settling the island, he tried to enslave the native workforce. And they didn't take to it, and most of them died of European diseases. The rest were worked to death. And the rest were worked to death, yeah. Others were killed or otherwise maimed by Columbus's brothers. Slavery. So, in order to make up for this workforce deficit, <clears throat> European traders began importing slaves from uh, from Africa into Haiti, right? Buying people on the African coast, transferring them to Haiti, putting them on plantations there. So there's no such thing really anymore as a native Haitian, right? The culture that has grown up in Haiti now um, is essentially an immigrant slave culture um, that combines elements of traditional West African cultures with some French influence. So the French ruled Haiti from the early 17th to the early 19th centuries. They called it saint -Domain. And does anybody know what the primary economic activity was? Like how Haiti became a successful colony? Sugar farming. Yep, sugarcane. If I'm correct, for the slave revolt, that island was the number one producer of sugar in the world at the time, and after mm -hmm. the slave revolt, became Cuba. Yeah, enormously productive sugar plantations, and there was a great big um, sugar craze in Europe in the 18th century. Um, things sweet. 
Yeah, well, yeah, prior to, I mean, sugar cane doesn't grow in Europe. You can grow sugar beets, but um, they're, you know, it's inefficient. You don't actually get much sugar from them, and the sugar that comes from them kind of sucks. So sugar cane produces a much, more, a much higher quality sugar, and it's much more efficient, right? You get more sugar out of the cane than you do out of beets. So people in Europe went nuts for sugar. And so the Haitian colony, the Saint-Domingue colony was producing more and more and more. Working these people harder and harder. Exactly. So from 1791 to 1804, there was a series of slave revolts Right, slaves uh, burning sugar crops, attacking the plantations where they worked, um, going after plantation owners, and finally in 1804 the French relent and give them their independence. So, while this is, pardon? And this would be around the time of the revolution, correct? This would be, uh, yeah, this would be a few years after. The revolution's in 1789 in France. So, you know, the Haitians, you know, well, hey, hey, we're not included in any of these new rights of man that you're drafting. Um, hypocrisy. Yeah, and so and they started. Right, couldn't put them down because. <laughs> right, because, so because, they, because they were too busy with their own internal troubles. But yeah, so slave revolts, yes. 1804, Haitian independence. But even this independence doesn't lead to freedom for most people. From this period on, Haiti is ruled mostly by a series of dictators, some democratically elected, some not. So when we think of Haiti as an impoverished country, that's not strictly accurate. It's not so much that it's impoverished, People. It's yeah, it's ridiculously unequal. Right, there's a very small number of very rich people who run just about everything on the island. And everyone else is quite poor. So yeah, it's not so much a poor country as it is a very unequal country. So <clears throat> at the time that this story takes place, there is still within recent, um, it, it takes place during one of several dictatorships, but there's still in recent memory the reign of Jean Duvalier, who was better known as Papa Doc. Papa being the nickname given to a voodoo high priest, Doc because he was a medical doctor. So, do any of you know anything about Haitian voodoo? Yeah, it comes initially from West Africa, or at least the basis of it <laughs> is West African, right? It's what's called a syncretic religion. Mm, so, sort of like <laughs> Tangri. What's that? So, kind of like Tangri, the Tangri faith. It takes and incorporates mm -hmm. things from other religions. Yeah, um, it's not so much that it takes and incorporates things from other religions. What happens is um, the religion of a minority population meets the religion of a majority population. The majority religion tries to absorb the minority population, and the minority population resists but adopts some forms and features of the majority religion, right? So. Um, for example, like there are you know, minority religious groups in the Middle East, like uh, the Yazidis and the Druze, who are persecuted sometimes if they live in areas that are dominated by Muslims or Christians. 
So the Druze in particular have adopted some superficial features of Islam in order to avoid being persecuted. So what happens in the case of voodoo, right, is you have, you know, these West Africans practicing their traditional beliefs, their traditional religion, while the French plantation owners are trying to force them to convert to Roman Catholicism. So, the slaves then begin worshiping their traditional gods, often in the guise of Catholic saints. Right? They come to associate some of these you know, older gods, like Legba, um, with particular Catholic saints. And you see similar superficial features of worship as well. Right? Um, a lot of use of candles, for example, um, in voodoo and in Catholicism. You know, there are a lot of people who will go to the Catholic Church on Sunday and will then go to voodoo ceremonies later on. Right? Pardon? Well, I mean, it's, it's not, and I, I think we have an image of this as something more sinister than it really is. Um, the main goal for the average practitioner right, is to invite into yourself benevolent ancestor spirits called Loa. Right. This is in part how this is directly relevant to this particular story. Right. In some ways, uh, this particular practice is similar to uh, what happens in some Pentecostal church. Right? You're trying to invite the spirit into yourself, right? Pentecostalism is what you get when West African uh, religion meets Protestantism. Voodoo was what happened when it met Catholicism. Right, so this is the basic background for much of what's going on here. So let's get back to um, what you were say, um, saying earlier, sir, about those lines, right? That Little Guy is reciting for his play. Can I get somebody to, can I get a volunteer to read the first set of his lines? On page um, Which. It, well, we've all got different books. Bookstores screw up, so um, wherever you can find them. A wall of fire is rising, and in the ashes I see the bones of my people. Mm -hmm. Not only those people who, whose dark, hollow faces I see daily in the fields, but all those souls who have gone ahead to haunt my dreams. At night I, I live once more the last caresses from the hand of my loving, from the hand of the loving father, a valiant love. A beloved friend. Okay, and this is where you saw foreshadowing, right? That something's going to happen to the father, right? What? Where do we see direct references here to the relationship between this father and son? How are they always interacting with each other? Or how is the father always interacting with his son? Always hugging him, Yeah, but there's a specific way he does it, right? What's he always doing on his son's head? Oh, hey. Pardon? Moving his hand over his head. Yeah, he's always drawing circles on the little boy's head, right? And right, this this idea that it's the last caresses from the hand of a loving father, right? Suggests something's going to happen to loving father. Right, that this is a relationship that can't last. Now, the guy to whom this speech is attributed, right, the character that the little boy is supposed to be playing in a school play is a guy who was known to history as Duddy Bookman. We don't really know if this was his real name. And Bookman was the leader 
of that initial 1791 slave revolt. Bookman as in um, like foreman, something like that, correct? Well, it's suggested that he was given the name because he could read. Mm -hmm. um, which would have been unusual. Especially for, for Yeah, particularly for a slave in a French colony in 1791. Um, so, Bookman is the leader of the 1791 slave revolt. And essentially, what, what these slaves did to begin the revolt, right, they burned the sugar crop. There ain't nothing of value left on that one once that's gone. Mm-hmm. So this wall of fire literally represents the burned sugar crop, right? The destruction of the thing that they're forced to work towards. But it has a symbolic resonance as well, right? The wall of fire is also the beginning of the revolts, which is supposed to lead to freedom. Now, how might this be related to another important image that we see in the story? What else do we see in the story that's, that seems to us to be associated with freedom? Yeah, Darius. Is the, the um, hot air balloon? Yeah. And on what principle does a hot air balloon work? Fire. Fire. Fire, yep. You light a fire under a big bag, big bag inflates, takes you up, right? So the same freedom that Guy is obsessed with, right, is directly related to this wall of fire that his son is talking about in his little lines from his school play. But <clears throat> these freedoms are complicated, right? For one thing, what are we told about Little Gee's lines? How authentic are they? They're not. They're written by an Englishman. Oh. They're long mm -hmm. and heavy. Yeah. And it states that you have all uh, the real men rolling over his grave. Right. It was obvious that this was a speech written by a European man who gave to the slave revolutionary bookman the kind of European phrasing that might have sent the real bookman turning in his grave. So the words themselves, even though they're supposed to be the words of, the great, of a great slave revolutionary, the speech is written by a European man. Certainly not in the language of Bookman himself or of the Haitian people generally. Now what about the hot air balloon? Why is the hot air balloon more complicated than simple freedom? What goes up must come down. But the, the balloon doesn't come down, though, right? Mm -hmm. Gee comes down. <laughs> the balloon stays up. It's like flies into the sky. Mm -hmm. But he can't stay, right? He gets up there, but he can't stay in it. Where is the balloon kept? The sugar mill. Yeah, it's by the sugar mill. Right, another site of important symbolic resonance we'll unpack in a minute. And can anybody just walk up to it and take it? Yeah, it's behind a fence, right? And who's it belong to? Yeah, young Assad, right? The son of the rich family that owns the sugar mill. So there are plenty of obstacles between Guy and this imagined freedom. Now I think this is in some way related 
to the fact that he's always drawing circles on his son's head. Right, a circle, this is a repetitive closed pattern, right? It's closed and it's cyclical. Right, repeats itself, replicates itself over and over and over again. So, where else do we see images related to, say, freedom being curtailed? Things being fenced or caged? Oh, all Okay, you have the TV. Yeah, can you uh, can you take us there? The part about the television. Anybody? Their feet sounded as though they were playing mm -hmm. a wet one instrument as they slipped in and out of the puddles between the shacks and the shanty town. Near the sugar mill was a large television screen and iron grill cage that the government had installed so that the shanty town dwellers could watch the state sponsored news at 8 o'clock every night. After the news, a uh, gendarme. gendarme would come and turn off the television set, taking home the keys. The keys. Mm -hmm. On most nights, people stayed at the site long enough to your darn had gone and told stories to one another beneath the big white screen. They made bonfires with dried sticks, corn husk paper, cursing the authorities into their breath. All right, cool. Thank you. All right, so <clears throat> a couple of important things here, right? First off, the TV is in a cage, right? Probably the only TV in town. And what do they watch on it? State-sponsored news. State-sponsored news, exactly, right? Only the information that the government wants them to have. Glorious North Korea just won all the gold medals. Exactly, yeah. That's all they get is news filtered through the state, right? Censored programming. Right, it's guarded by a cop with a key. who unlocks the cage when the news starts, locks it back up when it's over. And does everybody just disperse and go home when the news is over? Now, what do they do? They light fires. Yeah, they sit there, they light fires. And curse the authorities under their breath, right? So in the face of this oppression, repression, whatever kind of oppression you want to call it, what are they going back to? The traditional roots. Yeah, they're going back to the 1791 rebellion on a much, much smaller scale and in a much weaker sense, right? Kind of you know, ineffectual mini revolt. Right, the past repeats, but it's not going anywhere yet. We're still stuck in these cycles. Now, <clears throat> what do we know about the sugar mill? Why is he so excited when he comes home at the beginning of the story? Because he has to work at the sugar mill. Yeah, he's got a few hours work at the sugar mill. Right. Why is this such a big deal? Because he hasn't worked for a while. It's better work than working in the fields. Yeah, normally like the people, mm -hmm. like when they leave, they pass it down to their family members. Yeah. 
Yeah, people only get these jobs, or permanent jobs, through nepotism, right? Right, you can only get on by and large if you know somebody. And are we told, has, I mean, has he been working in the fields all this time? Yeah, he just hasn't been working, right? Why hasn't he been working? Yeah, there's nothing else to do, right? There is no other work. The only option is the sugar mill. This is the only employer. So if you can't get work at the sugar mill, you can't get work. If you can't get work at the sugar mill, you're screwed. So even a few hours cleaning toilets at the sugar mill, he seems to regard as better than being idle, right? Now, so what that the only employer in town here is a sugar mill? What is this supposed to remind us of? All back to the slave revolt, right? The traditional agricultural activity of Haiti since the French showed up there. So, again, we have this reference to historical cycles repeating. They're not free of the sugar cane, right? They're not free from the tyranny of the sugar mill. Um, incidentally, do any of you watch The Walking Dead? A couple of you? How many of you are at least aware of it or have seen it? Okay, most of you, right? Filmed right here in Georgia. Um, are any of you aware that the zombie myth actually originates in Haiti. Okay, you yes, good. Do you know where do you know where it comes from? Just that it comes from Haiti. Yeah. Um, they, um, the, the, um, they would have poison people and they would sort of go down in this sort of um, dormant like state and they would it looked like they were dead they were just, while they were still alive, right? Yeah, um, there were yeah there were ways that you could use chemicals, drugs to make people look dead while they were still alive, um, but the idea of these sort of shambling automatons with no will um, actually sort of comes from uh, slaves newly arrived in the colony who saw slaves who had been through the sort of the infamous breaking process, and they saw these people walking around looking like they had no will of their own, right, <clears throat> and they assumed that these were walking corpses. So this is a long, you know, there's a long, long legacy of brutality and denial of freedom in Haiti. And it's all tied up with the sugar industry. Now, <clears throat> I am not, by the way, like a paid spokesperson for stevia or sugar substitutes or anything like that, trying to get you to go out and sweeten your drinks with something else. But it probably wouldn't hurt you. Um, so what is it, sort of along the same lines, that leads to a fight between Guy and his wife? Yeah. He wants to put Little Gee on the list, right? Mm -hmm. Because then he will be assured of a job when he gets older. Lily does not want this. Why does she not want her son on this list? Mm -hmm. Yeah, she thinks her son can do other things, right? Can do better things. But what's the problem? There is nothing else to do. There's nothing else in this place to do, yeah. So if he doesn't go on the list, okay, that leaves his options open. But what good does that do you if you don't have any options? 
if this is the only game in town, the only way you're going to get a job, the only way you're likely to make a living, is to essentially enslave yourself to the sugar mill. Right? It's this or not work. Why, does, why do you think he gets so offended when Lily does not like his idea? Because he's the one to work at the sugar mill. Yeah, he's been trying to get work at the sugar mill all this time. And what does it suggest about him if she thinks that the son can do other things? That he's a yeah, I mean, Guy, Guy hasn't managed to do anything else, yeah. right? He has not found another way to make a living. So he feels that this reflects poorly on him if his wife thinks that his son can do other things but that he can't. Let's, actually, let's look at that exchange. Um, if you have the green book, it's on page 241. If you have some other book, it's on some other page. Yeah, okay, thank you, Frank. So, right. <clears throat> I was born in the shadow of that sugar mill, he said. Probably the first thing my mother gave me to drink as a baby was some sweet water tea from the pulp of the sugar cane. If anyone deserves to work there, I should. What will you be doing for your day's work? Would you really like to know? There is never any shame in honest work, she said. They want me to scrub the latrines. It's honest work, Lily said, trying to console him. I am still number 78 on the permanent hire list, he said. I was thinking of putting the boy on the list now, so maybe by the time he becomes a man, he can be up for a job. Lily's body jerked forward, rising straight up in the air. Guy's head dropped with a loud thump onto the mat. I don't want him on that list, she said. For a young boy to be on any list like that might influence his destiny. I don't want him on the list. Look at me, he said. If my father had worked there, if he had me on the list, don't you think I would be working? If you have any regard for me, she said, you will not put him on the list. She groped for her husband's chest in the dark and laid her head on it. She could hear his heart beating loudly as though it were pumping double, triple its normal rate. You won't put the boy on any lists, will you? She implored. Please, Lily, know more about the boy. He will not go on the list. Thank you. And then what does he transition into? The balloon. The balloon. Yep. Okay, fine. I won't put the boy on any list, right? I won't do anything to the boy that will constrain his future or destiny. Let's talk about the balloon. I have seen the man who owns it, he said. I've seen him get in it and put it in the sky and go up there like it was some kind of kite and he was the kite master. I see the men running after it trying to figure out where it will land. Once I was there, and I was one of those men who were running, and I actually guessed correctly. I picked a spot in the sugarcane fields. I picked a spot from a distance, and it actually landed there. Let me say something to you, Guy. Pretend that this is the time of miracles, and we believed in them. I watched the owner for a long time, and I think I can fly that balloon. The first time I saw him do it, it looked like a miracle. But the more and more I saw it, the more ordinary it became. You're probably intelligent enough to do it, she said. I am intelligent enough to do it. You're right to say that I can. Don't you think about hurting yourself? Think like this. Can't you see yourself up there, up in the clouds somewhere like some kind of bird? If God wanted people to fly, he would have given us wings on our back. You're right, Lily, you're right. But look what he gave us instead. He gave us reasons to want to fly. He gave us the air, the birds, our sun. Now they're referencing here um, another <coughs> folktale that people of West African descent in parts of the Caribbean and the Southeast um, continued to tell, particularly in the 19th century. The basic idea was that back in Africa, Africans had been able to fly, but lost the ability when they were brought to the Americas. But there was still the potential in there for that ability to return. And sort of at the time of greatest need, they would be able to fly again and return home. 
So that's part of what's going on with the balloon, this desire to fly, this desire to get out of an oppressive situation. And that's sort of part of what's going on here as well, right? Lily is presented as a sort of counterbalance to her husband, right? What's Lily's attitude towards all of this, towards the balloon, towards everything? Yeah, keep things as they are, right? We'll manage, we'll get by. Keep your head down and be practical, right? Whereas Guy seems to fall more into the dreamer category, right? Mm -hmm. Right, Guy is unsatisfied with his life as it is. wants something better, but can't seem to grasp it, right? Can't seem to get there. I don't understand you, she said. Our son, your son, you do not want him cleaning latrines. He can do other things, me too. I can do other things too. A loud scream came from the corner where the boy was sleeping. Lily and Guy rushed to him and tried to wake him. The boy was trembling when he opened his eyes. What is the matter, Guy asked. I cannot remember my lines, the boy said. Lily tried to string together what she could remember of her son's lines. The words slowly came back to the boy. By the time he fell back to sleep, it was almost dawn. Why do you think this little boy is so worried about remembering these lines from this play? He wants to make them proud. And sure, yeah. Like really proud of him when he did the lines first. Yeah, I mean, like on the literal level, right? Okay, it's a big deal for a little kid to be given this many lines in a school play, right? You want to do your teachers proud, you want to do your parents proud. Does he think he'll give them like an escape? Like if he does really well with this, he can keep doing more work. So he doesn't have to do it with Yeah, I, I think it's important to remember, yeah, that this is for a school play, right? And in large part, at least, you know, in elementary school and high school, right, you do well in school by memorizing things and doing what you're told, right? That's how you advance. That's how you get on. That's how you move ahead. All right. Memorize these lines. Do what I say. And why does getting ahead in school matter? When you get ahead in school, you can get out on the time. Right. That's, you know, the whole, idea, the whole idea, right? You get ahead in school, you do well in school, right? You can go to college and get a better job, and you won't have to do things like clean latrines, right? You can be a doctor or a lawyer or something else. Right, a teacher, whatever. Right, so it's a promise of a better future. But usually a better future in some place other than the place where you live or where you grew up, right? Particularly if you are someone who is going through schooling in an area of limited means and limited opportunity, right? If little Guy wants to do something with his schooling, he's going to have to leave. He's going to have to go somewhere else. So he's being raised in a way to, sort of, to get out of the circle, to escape the circle. But his father and other forces are still drawing circles around him. Everywhere he looks, it's fences and circles. Everywhere any of them go, it's fences and circles. Now, <clears throat> As regards the end of the story here, why do you think Guy falls out of the balloon? I don't think he fell out. <clears throat> um, I think he fell. 
It's probably pushing. Maybe you jumped out. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's a Maybe he didn't want. He didn't want to wait. I don't know. Maybe he didn't want to live. I don't think he wanted to die. I think he was just Maybe he felt like he couldn't provide for his family. He didn't want to live with them because. Maybe he was just escaping. Maybe he was just outside. I think he was just an escape. I thought it was okay, completely different. You think, okay, so let's, you think that just the death is his escape, is his way out, or that? Yeah, I guess I could. Yeah, he always say like, I want to go to the sky and build a house and stuff like that. So maybe just mm -hmm. like a different, not a different life, but you know, something different, escape from the life that he's in now to something else. Mm -hmm. And yeah, death is, is definitely something different. Um, that's yeah. <laughs> definitely taking things in a whole, a whole other direction. So okay, so you so you're looking at you know, sort of death is sort of an escape from poverty, from his obligations, from whatever. I, yeah, um, I think that's not a bad reading, in part because like how does how does he envision his escape? Does he envision taking wife and boy with him? No. Yeah, it's a solitary escape, right? Yeah, and yeah the. <laughs> He manages to fly the balloon by himself, which the, the guy who owns it actually thinks is pretty incredible. It's like, how the hell did he get up there, right? Yeah. It takes a village, right? It takes a team to get the balloon up there into the sky. But, God, but Guy manages to do it all by himself. And then jumps out. Maybe he thought he could fly. What's that? He thought his wings were going to come back. <laughs> okay, wait. Well. Let's look at the, the jumping bit here, right? The boy was looking up, trying to see if his father was really trying to jump out of the balloon. Guy was climbing over the side of the basket. Lily pressed her son's face into her skirt. Within seconds, Guy was in the air, hurtling down towards the, the crowd. Lily held her breath as she watched him fall. He crashed not far from where Lily and the boy were standing his blood immediately soaking the landing spot. So all we can say for sure is that he certainly jumps out of the balloon. He didn't Pardon? He didn't even know he jumped out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, Gabrielle, go ahead. So the balloon keeps going away, right? Mm -hmm. So is it like one of those things where well, if I can't have like, the freedom that I want, nobody wants to have? Because if it keeps going away, then I don't mm -hmm. sure the guy has to let him get a new one. Okay, sure. Moment, everybody's stuck there like he does. But then mm -hmm. you get in the car chasing after the balloon. Yeah, the, right, the guy who owns it. I think one thing we have to remember too is, yeah, the, the, the balloon belongs to the rich guy, right? Yeah. So freedom, as it's presented through most of the story, right, is a prerogative of the rich. Right, young Assad has the balloon, young Assad has a car, right? Mm -hmm. Seems to be the only person in the village who has a car. So mobility, right, is a function of privilege. Right, Guy doesn't have that. Nobody has that, but he manages to steal it for a little while. but he does not continue on. He either jumps or gets dragged back down to the earth. Now, what does this provoke from his son? The lines. He starts reciting the lines. Yep, the son starts reciting the lines, right? Little Guy was breathing quickly as he looked at his father's body on the ground. While the foreman draped a sheet over Guy's corpse, his son began to write, recite the lines from his play. A wall of fire is rising, and in the ashes I see the, the bones of my people, not only those people whose dark, hollow faces I see daily in the fields, but all those souls who have gone ahead to haunt my dreams. At night I relive once more the last caresses from the hand of a loving father, a valiant love, a beloved friend. Let me look at him one last time, Lily said, pulling back the sheet. She leaned in very close to get a better look at Guy's face. So on, so forth. 
The boy continued reciting his lines, his voice rising to a man's grieving roar. He kept his eyes closed, his fists balled at his side as he continued with his newest lines. There is so much sadness in the faces of my people. I have called on their gods, now I call on our gods. I call on our young, I call on our old, I call on our mighty and the weak. I call on everyone and anyone, so that we shall all let out one piercing cry, that we may either live freely or we should die. So I want to take us back to when we talked about context, right? And the idea that in Haitian voodoo, right, part of the, pro part of the practice is to try to summon these benevolent ancestor spirits into yourself and, you know, take on their qualities. So whose lines is the boy supposed to be reciting? Yeah. Bookman's, right, the slave revolutionary. And what happens to his voice at the end here as he's reciting the lines? Grieving world man. Yeah, this is not a little boy's voice anymore. This is the grieving roar of a man, of an adult man. So his father's death is inspiring the return of the slave revolutionary in the little boy, right? So not all of the historical cycles here that keep repeating are hopeless or negative, right? The little boy being possessed by the man here presents some sort of hope or you know, sort of way forward for the future. So I think the ending is probably not not as depressing as as you um, as you initially thought of. It's still depressing, but there is some element of hope there, right? There is some little bit of light at the end of this. Does anybody have any? Do uh, you guys have any further like questions, comments about this, about the homework, about anything? All right. So I have something to return to you. So sit tight for a minute, um, and. I'll see you on Wednesday.